I remember one day I worked, I used to work with um, our photographer, the Independent had an office in Belfast and we worked with a wonderful photographer called Buzz Logan, mm. who had been born into a loyalist family and was from the Shankill area. He was one of the nicest, kindest men I ever met. And um, at the end of working one day, he said to me, have you ever been in a loyalist pub? And I said, no. And he said, come on, I'll bring you to one. <laughs> so we went into the pub and there were three men sitting on bar stools up at the counter. And he introduced me to the three of them. And the only one whose name sort of registered was a man whose first name was Red, Red something. Mm -hmm. And he was the editor of the Shankill Bulletin. And he said to me, oh, you're from the, um, the Republic. Um, wh what part are you from? And I said, Banton, where the pigs are Protestants. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Southern Stars Coronavirus podcast. I'm the news editor, Siobhan Cronin, and this week's podcast is an interview with Bandon native and Sunday Times political correspondent and columnist Justine McCarthy. Justine, a highly respected campaigning journalist, talks about growing up in West Cork, starting her journalism career in the Southern Star, and some of the incredible stories she's covered in her wide-ranging and very impressive career. So Justine, welcome. Um, you're originally from Bandon, which a lot of people, I'd say, don't know. Uh, so tell me a little bit about your, your schooling and uh, growing up in West Cork. I was born into number 77 South Main Street, Bandon. We lived upstairs over my father's pub and undertaking business. And I went to uh, school in the Presentation Convent on the hill in Bandon until I was six. And then I went as a boarder to the Earth Lines in Black Rock and Cork right. until the Leaving Cert. So I was the youngest girl in the boarding school. And I didn't get any dividend from that because the second youngest looked younger than me. So she was everybody's pet, <laughs> I was just ignored. <laughs> So in a way, I suppose you grew up half in the city and, and half in West Cork. Yeah, it was a funny kind of existence, really, because uh, myself and my three sisters, we'd no brothers. We were all away in boarding school all the time and then we'd find ourselves back. And it, back in those days, Siobhan, when you went to boarding school, you went in in September. You came home in December for, Christmas. for two or three weeks for Christmas. You went back in, you got home at Easter and then you were there until the summer. There were no midterm breaks and there was no like weekend going home. So it was a very, very lonely existence, like from the age of six. And I can still remember, you know, the physical pain of saying goodbye to my mother when she dropped us off at the school. And then for the first week back, just crying my eyes out. And but it stood any, me. Was there any mention of you coming back home because you were so miserable? No, because the reason we were sent to boarding school was because our dad died suddenly when when I was four. Wow. And my mother had the business and she was only 39 and she was left with four daughters aged from 10 to one year. So, no, it would never have... I, I think we would have been fairly sensitive to young as we were to her circumstances that mm. we wouldn't have asked if we could come home. Yeah. And um, so do you have much of, of an affinity then? I often wonder that about um, children who go to boarding school. Do they have much of an affinity with their hometown at all? Or is your affinity with Black Rock? Oh, no, no. My affinity is with Bandon. And I'm very proud that I'm from Bandon. And I tell people at every opportunity that I'm from West Cork, <laughs> uh, exaggerating slightly the gateway to West Cork. And I do have an affinity because my parents were very well embedded in the town. And my, like my father was a politician. He was a local councillor and, and a businessman on the main street. And my mother stood for the local elections so we had very strong connections with Bandon. And of course, 
my grandmother was from Kilbritton and my grandfather was from Timaleague. Mm -hmm. So our roots are very, very deep in West Cork. And, and then party, again, what party with the family? Oh, Fianna Fien Fáil. Yeah, it's a bit of a mystery. My grandfather was a councillor, but he went independent. Um, we think there must have been a, a kind of a civil war falling out because he had been interned in Ballykindler in County Down. Mm -hmm. And we still have a letter that my grandmother wrote to him when he was in Ballykindler in the internment camp. And at that stage, my father was a baby. Um, like just born and she wrote this very business-like letter to her husband up at the other end of the county about you know the the orders for the bar and how the farm was going and barely mentioned the two babies she had as well yeah she had a she had a hard life I think there mm -hmm. and it really only struck me if you don't mind me just telling you this mm -hmm. it just struck me recently when I was watching this very powerful RT documentary on how women were abused during the War of Independence mm -hmm. and the Civil War something just clicked into place in my head because growing up always I heard the story of how my grandmother McCarthy uh, Nora was her name because she was there in the bar on her own mm. um, and you know there was the biggest regiment uh, the biggest battalion of the Essex regiment was in Bandon at that stage and it was very much a center of the, the um, war of independence every night when the bar closed she would pack up the babies on the pony and trap and most nights she would drive all the way out to Kilbritton to be with her family and when my mother, uh, who was from East Fork, came to live in Bandon, my grandmother brought her out to the backyard and showed her the bullet marks on the walls where the Black and Tans had shot, the, let off their guns. And I always knew that they had come in and got drunk in the bar. Mm. But when I watched that documentary, I realised why my grandmother, a young woman whose uh -huh. husband was at the other end of the country had to flee out those dark country roads like eight hours eight miles out on a pony and trap and what were Highly the bullets justine was that intimidation or was that just you know drunken messing what, what was that i assume it was drunken rampaging mm. yeah they used to come in and pillage the drink right so Gosh. war is a terrible thing and they're and had she spoken about it herself or was she very quiet about it? I never met my grandmother. Right. Um, she she died the year before I was born. Um, but she never spoke to my mother about it either. Um, I think like that generation, they kept an awful lot of what had happened secret, especially the women, mm. because it happened in the absence of the men mm. and they didn't tell. Mm. Gosh, there's a there's nearly a book in in your grandmother's story alone, isn't there? I know. Yeah, she seems to have been an amazing woman. Yeah, well, it is. Um, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, as they say. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. <laughs> um, and I, my my next question was was there much in your upbringing that influenced your your choice of career? But I I suppose we can see a little bit in that because I always have seen you as a campaigning journalist. And I suppose whether you knew it or not, in your DNA, there was probably that sense of looking out for the um, the underdog, I suppose. So, I mean, what, looking back, what would you see as, as what influenced you to become a journalist? It's something that always bothered me, really, because, you know, if you went for job interviews and they'd say, well, have you any journalists in your family? I actually made one up at <laughs> one stage. <laughs> I was so sick of me. being asked. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh my goodness, his name has gone right out of my head. The legendary editor of the Irish Times. There's been a few of those, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Way before your time. Anyway, he called me in for an informal chat as a sort of preliminary interview. And um, it's way before it's Conor Brady, is it? Oh, yeah, well before Conor Brady. And Somebody had told me that his best friend was an army man called Justin McCarthy. And um, he said to me, are you related to Justin McCarthy? Now, 
I am named after my father's best friend, who was called Justin McCarthy, but he was from Skibbereen, not the same man at all. I said, oh, yes, I'm named after him. So I was a bit disingenuous. But no, I don't think there's any journalist in our family. And over the years, I have come to the same conclusion as you have, that it was really my parents' appetite for justice. My mother had a real heart for justice that, that I inherited, I think, and that, that my sisters did as well. I remember when my, my eldest sister went to live in South Africa and when my mother went there to visit her, when she came back, she cried her eyes out telling us about the poverty right. um, in Soweto. And um, it just struck me, you know, what a good woman she was, that this mm -hmm. was the main story she came back with yeah. from exotic South Africa. Exactly. Yeah, it, yeah. Says, it says a lot about somebody, all right. Um, now, you left school in the Ursulines, and what was your next port of call after that? I packed up and went to the big smoke in Dublin mm -hmm. uh, to go to big adventure. The, college, <laughs> um, the College of Commerce in Rat Mines. It was the only place you could do journalism at that stage. This is mm -hmm. way back in the back uh, dark ages. And it was a two year course in Rat Mines. Basically, you learned to do shorthand and typing. And um, there were two fantastic years. There were 25 of us in that, uh, that year in college and five of us shared a house, five <laughs> of us country girls. So we, we, our house became the Mecca. Mm. It was where all the parties were and past pupils whom we had heard great stories about, you know, like Paul Drury, who was a huge name in Irish journalism from a very young age. They would come back and sort of lord it over us and we would think, oh, we're going to be like them someday. Um, so yeah, then from Rap Mines, I my first job, full-time job, was with a magazine in Rathcoolan County, Dublin, called Commercial Transport Magazine, oh, wow. uh, where I was the only reporter, and I wrote about articulated trucks and <laughs> hauliers, and uh, the high point of it was going to Buckinghamshire in England to mm. test drive a forklift truck. Well, and no, my I never feet... knew that about you. <laughs> My feet couldn't reach the pedals, so the instructor did the pedals and I just turned the wheel. That must have been an interesting review. <laughs> well, it was good training, you know, because you just had to pick up the phone and interview people and you just had to go out and interview big, strong men who really had utter disdain for this little girl writing course, about yeah. drugs. In those days. And you, you skipped a bit there, Justine, because... Did I not hear that you did your internship in no other than the Southern Star? That would have been between first year and second year in college, would it? I beg your pardon, Siobhan. How could I have overlooked <laughs> How could you have overlooked that? <laughs> um, it was called the ANCO scheme in those days. Oh, yes, um, yeah. So it was before FOSS. Mm. And uh, we had to go for eight weeks to... Your grounding in a provincial paper was absolutely essential in those days and it should be again I think mm. it's one of the big flaws in journalism now so I was lucky enough to go to the Southern Star and um, the first day I arrived uh, Liam O'Regan the publisher and uh, former editor, editor yeah, yeah. Right, Liam. Mm. arrived and it, they, they knew reporters office was up kind of wooden steps I think it was before my time, um, Justine, <laughs> if you don't mind me saying so. <laughs> I'm not quite elevated. sure. <laughs> it was a very elevated. It has position. changed a little bit. Basically. Across, <laughs> 20 years, we'll say. <laughs> well, it was lovely because you overlooked the printing press. And the Southern Star was one of the most progressive in terms of printing in those mm. days. It changed I think it was the, the web the, offset. Yes, it was the first, I think, to get a colour press. Um, yeah. And it would have been way ahead of the national papers, even on that. Score. Way ahead. Mm. That's right. Um, I had a brilliant time in the Southern Star. I stayed in a B&B &B in, um, I'm sorry, in a bedsit in Mrs. O'Sullivan's on Bridge Street. And it was up at the, <clears throat> up at the top of the house. And um, I used to go um, out on the road with the reporter, Leo McMahon, who was a wonderful colleague. Lovely He's only retired man. a few years ago, Leo. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And... Um, 
we used to, he used to drive over the mountains down to Castle Tambert and cover uh, the district court in the ballroom of the hotel. And it was usually Spanish trawler men who'd been caught illegally fishing. So you had this bizarre setup in a country hotel ballroom with these grizzled uh, fishermen who only spoke Spanish and these West Cork uh, sort of legal profession. And they'd be scratching around trying to find somebody who'd act as the interpreter. Um, but one of the um, oddest incidents I had was I had stayed at home for a weekend in Bandon and my mother was driving me back to Skid for the uh, district court on Monday morning. And my mother was a very fast, flamboyant driver. Um, we were going through Clan, uh, Clan Kilty, and it had rained and the road was like an ice rink. And there was a car in front of us. And because the street was so narrow, there was a car coming towards us. So the car in front of us stopped suddenly. My mother tried to stop suddenly, but of course, because of the um, slick surface, went flying into the back of the car in front of us. And this very angry looking man got out. And I said to my mother, he looks a bit familiar. And she said to me, don't worry now, leave this to me. Mm -hmm. So she went up to him and charmed the socks off him and said, oh, my brakes didn't work. And I'm so sorry. And um, he said to her, now you go on and drive in front of me and I'll trick. Oh, no. He, he said, I'll go on. And we drove behind. And she had to drive very slowly to show that she wasn't a fast, dangerous driver. <laughs> so she said to me, you know who that was? And I said, no. And she said, that was the judge. So I arrived in court and a court at that stage, the court was well underway. Well, he stopped the proceedings and I had to walk the whole way up the courtroom. And I said, now, Miss McCarthy, how is your lovely mother? I hope she's not injured. <laughs> you were caught <laughs> rotten. <laughs> rotten. <laughs> Rush, rushing to court. <laughs> yeah. well. but, um, the Southern Star was a great paper and it did all the local festivals. Mm. And it was really good grinding as well in, you know, things like getting captions right, mm. using Irish surnames and putting the Sheena Fadas where they're supposed to be, all those kind of fundamental rules that I think have been lost to a great extent in journalism. Yeah. And even I, you, at that stage, no more than myself, you're probably making the tea and maybe even doing a bit of cleaning around the office at the same time, which you're certainly not allowed to ask an intern to do these days. But well, there was a lovely printer there, Siobhan, and when yeah. I was leaving, he made my name on a, a metal, a hot metal um, a slab of blocks, yeah. block, block. Yeah. Um, and I put a chain on it to keep oh. as a necklace and I still have it to wow. this day. It's too heavy to wear, actually. Yeah. They're, they're very heavy and it's very tarnished. So if I put that on now, my shirt would be black. Yeah. But it's a very precious possession. That Gosh, I have. it is. Because it's even yeah. hard to find those presses nowadays. Yeah. The, the old letter set. Wow. Um, so after that, Justine, and then you had your time, of course, in the, the um, transport magazine. How did you get your big break into the national newspapers then in Dublin? I went to work for a new magazine that was set up in Dublin called Aspect and it branded itself as the rival to McGill mm. magazine. So it was going to be a current affairs and politics hard hitting magazine. And there was a staff of four of us, uh, three reporters and the editor. And I was the youngest and I suppose the least experienced. So after six weeks there, the magazine was hemorrhaging money and I was called in by the editor and told I was being sacked because mm. I had no writing style. Okay. So I went to the National Union of Journalists and they fought my case. They were marvellous. And um, my dismissal was um, nullified. But then four and a half months later, the publisher sacked the editor and the oh. three of us reporters. <laughs> and started producing the magazine from his own home in uh, County Wicklow. Um, but fortunately, when I was under uh, the cosh myself, 
I had applied for a job in the Irish Independent as a features writer, which I didn't get. But the features editor, Michael Brophy, asked me to come in for a chat. And I did. And I started freelancing in features in the Independent. And there I stayed for um, nearly oh, 20 years mm. after I, I, I was eventually staffed and became a full time features writer there. And you did some great work there. Um, you had some, I suppose that was a, also a time when Ireland was changing very rapidly socially. It was probably the beginning of the demise of the church for a lot of people. Um, and there was a lot of scandals breaking. Um, would you just maybe fill us in on some of the big stories you covered in The Independent, Justine? It was a very important time in, in Irish life. Yeah, it was a very exciting time to be a journalist. I was really lucky. Um, it was a time when people, you know, there was still a high level of um, respect for journalism in Ireland. And there were huge international stories in this country. The two biggest stories that were happening throughout that period, which have been the troubles in the North mm -hmm. and the beginning of the um, secrets of the Catholic Church coming out. Um, on the Troubles, I would have spent a, an awful lot of time in the North <clears throat> um, covering a lot of funerals, unfortunately, um, riots, elections. Um, there were quite dangerous times. And I have to say, I would have been nervous a lot of the time, but you couldn't let on mm -hmm. that you were. Um, I remember... Uh, interviewing Martin McGuinness when he would have been still very closely associated with his IRA activity in the North. Um, I covered the funerals of the um, three IRA members who were shot dead in Gibraltar. That mm -hmm. was an extremely tense time. Um, the funerals of the victims of the Shankill uh, road bombing, the Frizzell's fish shop. Mm. There were horrendous events. And I often <clears throat> wonder how my colleagues and I were affected by that. You know, we were interviewing people who were simply shell-shocked. Mm. And I think we must have been shell-shocked ourselves because we would have been caught up in riots. Well, you were like a you war know. correspondent, really. And a lot of people don't realise that the Irish reporters in, in the North were in effect war correspondents. Yeah, and to be a war correspondent in your own land, mm. I think is even more difficult. Um, even, you know, the minute you were across the border, it would come down on you, this feeling that of apprehension, mm. of vigilance. Anxiety. Of mm. Anxiety, concern that you were driving a car that was mm. recognizably from the South that your name was recognizably nationalist. Mm. I remember one day I worked, I used to work with um, our photographer, we, the Independent had an office in Belfast and we worked with a wonderful photographer called Buzz Logan, mm. who had been born into a loyalist family and was from the Shankill area. He was one of the nicest, kindest men I ever met. And um, at the end of working one day, he said to me, have you ever been in a loyalist pub? And I said, no. And he said, come on, I'll bring you to one. <laughs> so we went into the pub and there were three men sitting on bar stools up at the counter. And he introduced me to the three of them. And the only one whose name sort of registered was a man whose first name was Red, Red something. Mm -hmm. And he was the editor of the Shankill Bulletin. And he said to me, oh, you're from the, um, the Republic, um, what, what part are you from? And I said, Banton, where the pigs are Protestants. <laughs> and then there was silence and I said, uh, it's not meant to be pejorative, it's just that there's an awful lot of, and the more I tried to explain digging where it was. <laughs> <laughs> and the other time I got myself into that trouble was um, the time of the Lock on Island massacre oh, in yeah. 1994. Mm -hmm horrendous um, shooting dead of people who were watching the um, Ireland, Ireland, Italy World Cup World match. Cup. Yeah. And I was covering the funerals. And again, um, there were people like cross community mourners. 
And I had got a lift. I got the train to Belfast and I got a lift out there um, for the first funeral. But then I was stuck for getting to the next one. So I was walking along the country road and a car stopped with three men in it. And they said, are you going to the funeral? And I said, yes. And they said, we'll give you a lift. So I got into the back of the car. I had no idea who these men were. And the car passed a road sign for Ballykinder. Mm. And I said, oh my God, my grandfather was interned there in Ballykinder. <laughs> and I thought, oh, Justine, you're such an idiot. You don't know who these people are. It was fine. It was fine. And um, whether they were Catholic, Protestant, Unionist, you Nationalist, know. Loyalist, Republican, it didn't seem to matter. Mm. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, the thing that I found um, that sort of linked the trouble story with the Catholic Church story mm. was the extraordinary, for want of a better word, ordinary people mm. who got caught up in both stories. Mm. You know, the innocent bystanders in the north or in in the South who were caught up in it or on the, uh, in England, like in Warren Point. Uh, London Warren. And, and Brighton and uh, Birmingham. Yes, and the two mm. little boys. Yeah. Um, on the Valentine's Day killing in England. Mm. Um, they were so strong the way they got on with their lives. And it it was because of their strength in telling their stories, you know, that the whole awfulness was exposed. And that's the same with the Catholic Church story. Mm. It was the survivors themselves. It fell to them. And it's quite macabre, really, that it falls to the survivors to break the stigma. Mm. They were the ones who had to go out and talk about the awful things that were done to them mm. in order for the wall of silence to start crumbling. Mm. Um, you know, I think about how we congratulate the young generation for the same-sex marriage referendum, the success of it and the abortion referendum. And yes, they were fantastic and their energy and their commitment made such, such a huge difference. But if it hadn't been for the older generation, speaking their secrets mm. so painfully in the first place that kind of aura of respect mm. for the catholic church where you dare not challenge it or suggest that it wasn't perfect that that would not have started to break down so that we would live in the society that we live in now mm. so i think we owe those people massive um a massive debt of gratitude and I find that you know in trying to deal with historic child abuse we're very good at apologizing now but what we fail to do is to thank them thank them for what they have done for our country and Justine another story that I think you were you were there on the day as well was the day Veronica Gearin got shot would you have been in the office that day I was in the office and would yeah. you have known Veronica very well I didn't know her very well but I had great time for her because um this is quite a long story but this this is my connection with Veronica um I had written a story about the then Bishop of Ferns uh Brendan Comiskey um he had been uh, put in a drying out cell at Bangkok airport after arriving uh, off the plane drunk. Um, and there were, there were other aspects to that story as well. And I had a lot of um, uh, vitriol coming my way that weekend after that appeared in the paper on the Saturday. And I had never met Veronica and I didn't have much support from my own colleagues that weekend who probably weren't aware of what I was going through. My mm. phone never stopped ringing with journalists from other newspapers mm. and RTE. And uh, on the Monday morning, I switched on the radio and Veronica was being interviewed about some crime story she had written. 
And at the end of it, the interviewer said to her, oh, by the way, your colleague in the Irish Independent, Justine McCarthy wrote this, um, do you believe this? And Veronica said, I don't know anything about it. But, and then she said something very nice about me and said, if Justine wrote it, I believe it. Mm. And that just meant the world to me. So the next time I saw her in the canteen in Independent House, I went over and thanked her. And I remember distinctly what she said to me was, if we don't stand up for each other, nobody else is going to stand up for, her, for, for us. So when she died and there were some negative things written about her, those words echoed in my head. Mm. And I felt that I had a duty to stand up for her then, mm. you know. No bad turn goes unrewarded. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, well, that's the essence of, of justice, really, isn't it? And um, yeah. campaigning journalism, really, that you have to you have to stick up for people when they're going yeah. through a tough time once they're on the right side. Yeah. Um, I do remember Siobhan covering her funeral. Yeah. And the absolutely heartbreaking image of her little boy. Mm. Uh, beside her coffin in the church mm. you know for what why was that child left without his mother you know such a waste of her life she, she was so much more but but an awful lot did change from that moment on to justine and you'd have to say at least some good did come from it you know we have cab now which is still doing fantastic work and there was a kind of um it was a bit like um something changed that day um, yeah. that you know an unwritten rule was broken that um, there was no coming back from it after that and yeah. you know I often think that you know that was her legacy that we are tough now I think we are tough now in organized crime in a way that we mm. weren't before that. Um, Were you in the Irish Independent at that time Siobhan? I was it was I remember the yeah. day I remember the day very very clearly yeah um, and I remember walking up into the newsroom and this utter silence Mm. and people just sitting at their desks in shock shock well I was only there about two weeks at that stage I had joined that that summer and I one of the things that had really struck me was that I was now working in a building where Veronica Guerin was working because I was actually a major fan um I had read all her articles on crime and I was really um impressed by the fact that I was in the in the same building (laughs) I got an awful an awful shock that day that that crime had come so close to us as well and it was yeah. right on our doorstep now which it never had been really before for journalists yeah you know we had never become the story before that um and my next question was you know does the job ever get you down and I, I suppose you've kind of answered that in a few ways but does it ever get you down to the point that you want to throw in the towel and say you know there's too much badness in the world i i, I can't cope with this no No, I've never reached that point um, because for all its um, problems, journalism is still the best fun you can have. Um, It's such a privileged job. Um, You know, you get to be at events um, in the middle of unfolding stories. You get to travel to places you'd never get to otherwise to meet people, to ask people outrageous questions that you wouldn't dream of asking in polite society. Um, but I'm working as a political correspondent now. So, you know, Leinster House is my office. Mm. And there's not a day that I walk in those gates when I don't kind of, you know, um, metaphorically pinch myself and think, I am so privileged to be able to walk in here to the House of Parliament and talk to people um, who are, whatever you think of politicians, they are making decisions Mm. that define and dictate our lives. And um, yeah, journalism is just so exciting. Um, It is, but Justine, do you not find in the last few years that this whole fake news thing is becoming terribly depressing. We, I mean, we never even heard the phrase a few years ago. And now everything you do, every time you you look at Twitter, every time you put pen to paper, you're questioned, you know, are you writing the truth? And which is an awful insult to the likes of you and me that have been doing this for, I've been doing this for 34 years this year. And, you know, it would never dawn on me to put something on paper that wasn't true. I hadn't checked out. So do you not find that very 
very disillusioning altogether. I find that very hard um, right through my career and it's and it has increased in the last few years. And while I haven't developed a thick neck and it still gets to me, I have had to, and I'm sure you found this as well, I've had to find a way to cope with it. Mm. And the way to cope for me is to keep reminding myself that the vast majority of people are, are good, well-intentioned, kind-hearted, intelligent people who do um, who who do investigate the truth for themselves. Um, but I do agree with you, it has become such a thing that it is an acceptable part of the furniture of journalism now. In a way, that's a greater challenge for us. Um, I also think that the meat, journalism itself needs to put its hands up and admit how it has contributed to the dumbing down of society. And I remember that starting to happen early on in my career, mm. when I realized that um, newspaper design was becoming far more important than the journal, than the reporting, you know, that if you had a page of a feature, nearly half the page now was a picture, a third of it was the headline and the, and the space for the copy was getting squeezed and squeezed mm. uh, with your self-editing background, I'm sure <laughs> you might disagree with me. But also the whole kind of emphasis on uh, glamour journalism, this kind of superficial, what I would think of as daily mail journalism, you know, mm. where they photograph a close up of some celebrity's thigh and go, shock horror, she's got cellulite and there's mm. a whole page on it, you know, and sometimes you write a story that you think is really important and should be debated in a public forum and it goes completely under the radar and nobody ever mentions it and they're talking about some celebrity couple who are getting a divorce and that a royal be wedding really or a royal baby or exactly pages and pages. Yeah. but but are we blaming ourselves a little too much in that instance in that you know, I was always taught that actually the public dictates what goes in the paper because if they buy it, they like it. And also there was a, a feeling around the early 80s that people's attention span was becoming less and less and they couldn't read the long, the long articles. And I think there's been a bit of a, um, a kind of a moving, a circular movement there in that people are now looking for the longer reads. And you see that a lot of websites online, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, the currency, some of the articles in the journal, they're much longer now and people are actually seeking them out online for the long read. And maybe yeah. maybe we were sick of the, you know, the short, um, sassy, you know, celebrity piece and we want real journalism again. Yeah, I think so. Um, I think we were wrong and we need to admit it. We were mm. wrong that people have the attention span of a mat. <laughs> people actually do want um verifiable trustworthy information and they want it in depth uh, they don't want to scratch the surface that's twitter you know um so i think there has been a kind of a return to that i remember when i worked in the sunday tribune my editor noreen hagerty rang me one day i was actually coming back from the north in the car and she said i want you to do a four page profile of dennis o'brien and I said, four pages of what? Like mm. thinking my notebook. Page four. <laughs> <laughs> of the broadsheet newspaper. I said, but Marianne, that's about 6,000 words. And she said, exactly. Mm. Do eight if you want. I couldn't believe it. The pure joy of being able to get right mm. into, you know, a subject and do it well. It was such a pleasure. But people read it. People mm. bought it. You know, people kept people it, I'd say, even. I have it, yeah. <laughs> but for when I write the book eventually. <laughs> I'm sure Dennis has kept it as well. You probably find. And his um, lawyers. <laughs> yes. Um, so do you think on the whole, in the last, we'll say, 30, 40 years, Justine, do you think Ireland is a better place now than it was when you started out? Undoubtedly, yeah. It's a much nicer, more interesting, tolerant uh, more gentle 
place. I mean, when I started out, there was violence every day when you turned on the radio was a bomb went off or somebody was shot dead. Um, there was there was oppression in this country and not not just because of the violence, but because of the monotheistic dominance by one church. And I mean, the body politic was completely cowed by that. There was no real debate. There was no diversity in the Dole. Um, there's still very little ethnic diversity, but mm -hmm. at least we are increasing the gender diversity very, very slowly. Mm -hmm. But in our society generally, I think it's growing. And I think society is much in the better of that. Mm. And many men would agree with that, that, you know, because women are contributing more to society now, it's a better country. Um, I think there's less judgmentalism, um, but it's still there. Mm. And there's still some very interesting debates that I feel the country is bracing itself to have. Um, I suppose the um, transgender issue is a big one that we mm. need to discuss and it's going to be difficult. Um, but at least we're grown up now and we can have conversations mm. um, without this tyranny of you can't say that. Or, mm. I remember that telling, telling my nephew a few years ago that when I was a teenager, it was illegal to be gay and he just couldn't get his head around it, just couldn't, couldn't fathom it at all. You know, yeah. and, and I thought that shows how much we've come. Yeah, I did a series. That. I did. You've just reminded me. I did a series of features in the Irish Independent way back from Monday to Friday. And it was called The Outsiders. And one in, was an interview with a woman who had gone abroad for an abortion. One was um, a couple who had a foreign divorce because they had foreign domicile. So you couldn't get divorced here. Mm. Uh, and even if you could, you couldn't remarry. Yeah. And another I'm one. I'm just laughing at the idea of them being outsiders now. <laughs> I know. But the other one was with uh, a male couple. Uh, one was a public, a civil servant, and the other was a teacher. And they were in their 40s and they were living together in Dublin. And they, it was the first, they were the first couple to come out, so to speak in an interview in the media, but we still could not identify them because it was a crime. Isn't that just bizarre? It shows oh, we've, oh, we've actually come a long way in a short space. Yeah, but we came a long yeah. way in a short space of time and you think that was only, you know, in, in your lifetime and mine, in your working career, you know? Yeah, I'm sure we're only young. Exactly, we've a long way to well, go. Well, I am anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but isn't it bizarre what we did to love in this country? Mm. The love that begat a pregnancy, the love between two men or two women. Mm. It, it was quite perverted. I or, think. or a couple wanting a fresh start, you know. Exactly. You yeah. could get divorced. And if you got divorced, you, you weren't welcome back in the church. Um, yeah. So my other question, I must keep an eye on the time because I, I, I know I could chat here with you for, for a long time mm -hmm. to come. During the and pandemic... Likewise. Justine, um, what have you been watching, reading, looking at? Do you shy away from I, from the job when you when you have downtime and watch okay. some, you know, The Crown or something? <laughs> no, I watched one episode of The Crown. And I thought, what are they talking about? Um, I haven't watched it at all, so I think we're the only two <laughs> left. <laughs> I watched the one, um, the Mountbatten one. All right, oh, yes. Well, that was oh. research for political journalism. You're... That's exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, my um, great escape has been Schitt's Creek on Netflix. <laughs> Have you watched it? I, I, I'm one of the ones who had, I didn't give it enough time. I know, I didn't give it enough time and I gave yeah. up and everyone tells me to stick with Four it. Four or five episodes. Hmm. Yeah, you will just fall in love with them. They're, they're lovely, funny people. And it's so mad and crazy. Hmm. It's this uh, Canadian, actually, uh, family of actors who made it. 
And um, it's about this uh, family and the father has been extremely wealthy and then he realises that uh, his accountant hasn't been uh, straight and he's totally broke except he has one asset, a town he bought for a joke and they have to move to the town and start their lives all over again. And, and the wife who is just brilliant, she's a TV actress, an afternoon soap star and... Um, Oh, they're just brilliant. So that, and I really enjoy The Queen's Gambit. Mm. Have you watched that one? I have watched that. About I've chess. That. Yeah, yeah. That. I'm nearly going to take up chess after it. Mm -hmm. um, some of the books I've enjoyed were, now I'm terrible on the names of novels, but I read um, oh, the one Goodness, it was shortlisted for the Booker. Uh, sorry, it was shortlisted for the Irish Book of the Year. Mm. And the name has gone right out of my head. I, no, I, I also read... Sorry, Sean, please. I just got a mental block. <laughs> Who wrote it? It was an Irish writer. I'm no good to you there now because I don't tend to, to read the, the popular fiction at all and as I'm reading them for work so yeah but not to worry damn it but I'm also uh, just after reading Patrick Frame's collection of oh, essays yeah fantastic I haven't read them There's yet but I've, uh, they, are they all his published work so we may have read some of them no no it's all no new. there are new essays I think right. one was previously published they're new essays and there is one in it. I was reading it in bed and I swear to God, I was in fits laughing. I, I got a fit of laughing out loud. He's a brilliant writer. Yeah, I loved any of his Dermot Bannon references anyway. Always made me giggle out loud. So, yeah, I must I must put that on my list. They're quite autobiographical, these essays. Right. And some of them are very funny. Some of them are very touching and quite sad. Mm. OK, nice mix yeah well justine thank you so much for joining us today and um i really enjoyed our chat and i think we'll have to come back to it because i think there's an awful lot more we could chat about and um and you're now with the sunday times which i hadn't mentioned so best of luck um for the next 20 30 40 years i i certainly hope and, <laughs> and have a lovely christmas as well and you too siobhan thanks a million and so to this week's newspaper. First off, this week's paper includes a bumper 128-page Christmas magazine stuffed with gift ideas from every area, a look back at pictures from a most challenging year, but there's also lots more, including a bumper quiz, some Christmas walks, Emma Conley's advice on how to cope with the relations through a COVID Christmas, some wonderful children's stories, film recommendations and some incredible recipes from Kathleen Ruth and the chefs at Pilgrims, Chestnut and Bastion. And as they say, much, much more besides. And in the main paper, we have tips on an eco-friendly Christmas. We hear how little Jackie McCullough from Dripsy is getting on since his late, late toy show appearance. And we also have a look at the cost of the County Mayor's BMW. In property, we have a lovely coastal home in Skull. And in motoring, we're looking at how you can get the most out of an older electric car. In our second section, we have Emma Connolly's COVID diary, where she's hopping on the dry road bandwagon. And we've all our usual economists, as well as local news from every corner of West Cork. So don't forget, if you can't get to the shops, you can subscribe online by going to southernstar.ie and clicking on the e-paper tab. Or call the office on 028 21200 for a postal copy to be sent out to you. And now for this week's musical treat. Claire singer Susan O'Neill and acclaimed singer-songwriter Mick Flannery, a previous guest on this podcast, won Best Original Folk Track of the Year for their duet Baby Talk at the RTE Radio 1 Folk Awards last week. Also involved in this fabulous success was Skibbery musician and producer Christian Best. Here is a version of the beautiful song recorded earlier this year in the Cork Opera House featuring the Cork Opera House Orchestra and mixed by Christian Best. i
star coronavirus podcast don't forget to like share and subscribe to our podcast which is available on itunes spotify youtube acast stitcher or wherever you get your podcasts